Welcome to the Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Hello, I'm Thomas Hubert, Digital Editor with the Irish Farmers Journal. Welcome to our weekly podcast. All the dairy co-ops are lining up their best suppliers in preparation for the National Milk Quality Awards, and this is a good opportunity to meet the farmers and the co-op managers. This week, I was at Lakeland's event in Virginia, County Cavan, where Kevin McInerney won the Best Quality Award, and Lakeland Chief Executive Michael Hanley gave an update on dairy markets and the co-op's investments. I started by asking him how important Farmgate milk quality was to the business. Quality is paramount. Thomas, uh, if you have some quality, forget about going to any market. So it's, it's just a prerequisite to sell your product. You need top quality milk. It's as simple and straightforward that your customer is looking for top quality milk, not second quality. So we're fortunate in Lakeland in having top quality milk suppliers across uh, our catchment area. And today we recognise them with uh, uh, awards for the best milk quality milk suppliers across our business for 2015. Those markets, um, you seem to see some green shoots there. You, you made some positive comments today. You said the sentiment is better than six to eight weeks ago. What has changed in those past few weeks? Yes, as we see it, sentiment uh, has improved in the last six to eight weeks. Um, I suppose you look at two or three things. Uh, one is intervention uh, has purchased over in the region of 300,000 tonnes of skim milk powder. So that is a new customer, albeit at a bad price, in the marketplace, which has taken that volume of product off the market. Secondly, I suppose we're seeing that China is taking some extra product, more than it took last year. Uh, so that's a positive. Uh, a third positive is the fact that oil prices have hardened. Uh, oil price you know, went from $70, $80 a barrel down to about $30 a barrel, and that has hardened uh, well into the 40s and uh, almost $50 a barrel. So that's a positive on the oil price side of it because normally when oil price has been high, generally milk price has moved in tandem with it. So that's, that's a positive. And I suppose the other thing we're seeing is we're seeing supplies of milk, uh, particularly in the UK, have come back. Uh, you're seeing uh, uh, the extra milk flows that were coming, particularly in Germany and, Germany and France, have eased as well. Um, so, and, and then you have uh, New Zealand uh, farmers, I would say, would be set maybe to produce uh, less milk when the new season starts up. So, but having said that, Thomas, you know, skim milk is, and uh, is. is is only returning intervention returns at this moment in time so uh, we have a long long way to go but uh, we prefer to be looking at something that's uh, moving in the right direction uh, and that the sentiment has improved uh, that there's a growing demand for dairy and less of a supply of, of milk uh, in the market at this moment in time so uh, there are small positives but we've we've seen none of those positives uh, for the last two years so relatively it's it's positive but we have a long long way to go and yes we've seen last week um, Lakeland cut its milk price for its suppliers um, one and a half cent compensate with one cent from our new but that means next month that one cent is gone so are we going to see prices get worse before it gets better well look at we, we set our price on a monthly basis uh, we are a co-op we're farmer owned our goal is to pay as much as we can for every litre of milk uh, and we'll reflect the market for what we get for our uh, portfolio of products on a monthly basis so let's see what that brings you said today that the the investment in the new dryer at Bailey Bro just down the road from here is completed um, what does that mean when is it going to come into commission yeah, we've invested in a new dryer on the Baileyborough site. That site now has 19 tonnes per hour of milk powder capacity. So we're in the process of commissioning uh, that third new dryer as we speak at this moment in time. So you know we'll be working on that and commissioning that as we go through the, this season. You're, you're happy to go ahead and turn it on. Uh, you're not waiting for an upturn in market. You have outlets for this product. Yeah, Lakeland has always been uh, very optimistic in relation to dairy markets, uh, the medium to long term, and it's totally predicated on the fact that we have customers, a strong list of customers with growing requirements for dairy. The problem 
for us and the problem for everybody else is, is the fact that the benchmarks uh, that are applying out there, whether it's Dutch pricing or whether it's GDT, uh, those prices have been on the floor uh, at below intervention levels. So we badly need those prices uh, to harden, to come up and to see those uh, positive sentiments that I expressed a few moments ago, see those reflecting themselves into increased demand and stronger prices. You've also launched a fixed milk price scheme a few weeks ago. It's now closed. How did that work? How many farmers went for it? Yeah, we, we had a high percentage of uptake in the scheme. Uh, we offered 5 or 10% and a lot of people uh, went for the 10% uh, option in, in the fixed price scheme. So we're going through the, to, to the final figures as we speak on it, but in general we're very happy. It's our first scheme um, and we would some people wanted more than 10%, but we've limited it to 10%. And we will now go back and review it and see can we develop further options uh, to offer offer to farmers as we go forward because I think you know particularly as, as uh, you know we look back over what has happened over the last four to five years you know I think what our farmers are telling us is that they want certainty and uh, the option of fixing milk prices not at the bottom of the market or not at the top of the market but somewhere in between a lot of those farmers a lot of our farmers would be happy to uh, uh, you know to fix a reasonable percentage of their milk at a, at a, at a reasonable price so uh, we will go back and review that. Okay, Michael Hanley, thank you very much. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Last week, my colleague Anthony Jordan met Agriculture Minister Michael Creed for his first interview on our podcast. Anthony first asked Minister Creed about the delays in approving TAMS applications. Well, approvals are issuing. Look, I think the issue here is, you know, is the department to be faulted for having an ambition for rolling out the full range of schemes at the earliest possible date? We could have, like a whole host of other member states across the EU, decided, listen, we'll roll out some this year, some next year, some the year after. What we did was, and if we were to be faulted for anything, it's for ambition, we said we'd roll out all the schemes at the earliest possible date. We are, and I acknowledge, struggling to get the supports and administration in-house in order to deal with all of the level of interest in those schemes. But we are now issuing approvals, and I would hope that we will clear the backlog at the earliest possible opportunity. In terms of the new uh, 10 euro per use scheme, um, has there been any developments on it, or what will it involve? Well, it's a 25 million euro scheme. Uh, I, I know you're doing the maths on 2.4 million euros and, and, and 10 euros per euro, approximately 25 million. We haven't made a decision as to how it will be paid, whether it will be a payment per year or any other format yet. But we are in consultation with the various interest groups, including the farm organisations and others. The imperative from our point of view is that we get the scheme designed and submitted to the Commission by the end of June. It's imperative that it, it's a, a scheme that we submit that cuts mustard, that won't be the t- subject of tennis match over and back with the Commission, because our ambition is to get it approved, to get the applications out, to get the applications back in from the farming community and make payments as early as possible in 2017. And in, for that purpose, we are in extensive consultations, but it's not an open-ended. If we miss the 30th of June deadline, we won't have a scheme in 2017. And in terms of the glyphosate, it's, uh, the, it's up for extension the 30th of June. Um, what, are the, what is going to be the new basis should this not be um, continued? Well, it would pose enormous problems, at least for the tillage sector. Um, we are watching this space uh, actively. It, it arose out of um, a, a report within the, the UN umbrella, you know, linking um, glyphosate with, with possible uh, cancer scares. Um, in our view, um, this issue, ha- you know, is a, pr- is, is a real problem for us. It's remains to be seen whether the end of June will see an approval. I hope it does. Um, there's a little bit of question mark about whether the Commission will concerns about it? Well, it would, it, like, it would be devastating for, for our uh, um, farming community, but particularly for the tillage sector. Um, but it's, it's an issue that falls under the remit, not of the Agricultural Commission, it falls under the Health Commissioner. And uh, we are actually actively liaising with uh, Commissioner Hogan's <laughs> office on this issue. It, like if it came to, as I understand it, the, the Council uh, of Agriculture Ministers uh, are, are, uh, it requires QMV, but with Italy, France and Germany abstaining, QMV isn't, a, isn't an option. So it's, it's, it's extremely complicated, but we are doing everything we can to get this thing over the line. And when Minister Creed referred to QMV there, that was qualified majority voting, which requires a minimum number of countries representing 65% of the EU's population to agree before major decisions can be made. Not an easy task. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. 
This week, the IFA met politicians in Leinster House to launch a far-reaching campaign on farm incomes, and we have details on its propositions in this week's Irish Farmers Journal and at farmersjournal.ie. Our news correspondent, Odile Evans, met John Cochlan, the IFA's Munster chairman. The biggest problem on farm at the moment is a cash flow crisis and in every commodity, I think, at this stage. Um, and you know, farmers have come through the most expensive part of the year, the springtime, and they now probably have been too busy working for a lot of it to really realise the financial consequences of what has happened. But I think, look, we have a serious cash flow crisis looming for every farmer, especially in the milk, grain, and the pig sector. And I think, look, the soundings from the beef industry don't look too promising for beef farmers. And I think certainly, look, I mean, the, in my view, the industry as a, as a whole has to wake up and realise that farmers cannot take all the pain themselves. We have yet to see the industry come out and decide to try and support agriculture. And I think that's the one that has to happen. Now, farmers have to be supported at present, get over this low commodity prices. And look, cash flow is a problem for the simple reason that every family today needs yeah. an income. And the banks are getting a fair old criticising at the moment as well. Well, obviously, because look, I mean, farm interest rates to farmers are astronomically high compared to what businesses are paying across the, the country and to compare to what farmers are paying in other European and worldwide countries. And I think we need it. our banking system in Ireland, obviously, at this moment, moment is not functioning properly. But we, as farmers, should be able to get short-term money at less than 3% hmm. quite easily. And there was like a few sort of positive indications there in the milk market, and then only in the last few days the news broke that a lot of the co-ops had cut their prices. I mean, surely there's been a big reaction from that as well on the ground. Yeah, and there's, a, there's a ferocious disappointment across across the board, like that co-ops have pulled the price again this month. And I think, look, as I've said already, it's time for the industry to realise that farmers can't take any more pain. And look, farmers are out there at the moment working for nothing. Farmers have bank borrowings that they can't meet. They have their rising debts with suppliers, and all they see is cuts every month coming at them. And yet they see the rest of the agricultural industry booming ahead. Mm-hmm. Everybody else gets paid first, and the farmer gets nothing at the end of it. That can't last much longer. The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Meanwhile, our Northern Ireland correspondent Peter McCann attended the Dairy Link Farm walk on Cavan Johnston's farm near Strangford in County Down. He discussed ways of improving the quality of grass on the farm's grazing platform with CAFRI advisor Conal Keown. The, the big challenge here in this farm is, is dealing with the dry weather. And June is always a difficult month for, for Cavan on this farm because the farm tends to dry out very quickly. The shortage of rain means that the fertiliser nitrogen doesn't be taken up by the grass plant uh, and it, grass wants to go to stem very quickly. So it's a matter of Calvin taking decisions early on and what I have suggested to him is last week in May taking a look at the farm, getting a good walk around it, seeing what he can do in terms of taking out paddocks that are moving into the stem mode and getting them taken out of the grazing platform. If he gets them taken out then they'll come return back into the grazing platform quicker more quality grass coming up less stem get that stem removed bale it do whatever you can with it to get it removed out of the grazing platform and get that fresher greener grass and it, it also means that the grass quality is maintained the whole way through june and into july and that in turn holds his output up in terms of milk yields butter fat and protein for the whole of june and july so what the point i'm making is decisions calvin makes now in this farm have an impact right into july there really is the only op- the only option for calvin on this farm and in the small percentage of the farm that has moved into stem now he has to take it out as bales where's he going to make up the shortfall in that grazing he has second cut or first cut aftermath regrowth grass across the road so it's just a matter of him moving into that and having the flexibility to utilize that aftermath and close this year off for silage now the point is that he still needs to get this here back into the rotation. So the sooner he gets that bailed off, the better. And it means that that's coming back into the rotation again. Um, also, on, on this paddock, the first day he's grazing, the cows were, were grazing the grass standing. And then the second day, he decided to pre-mow it. 
talk me through the, the, the differences between the two. Yeah, the pre-mown was looked at here for this farm walk as an option to dealing with that type of grass, with the longer, stemmier, sward of grass. Um, it's not really an option for that grass simply because, look, we're, we're expecting the cows that are producing at the top end of the yield bands, we're expecting them cows to produce milk of good quality off that type of grass even though it's pre-mowed it's still hard stemmy grass and um, it's not the answer for this paddock uh, it was just really done as an experiment and as a demonstration for the for the visitors here today that there's a number of options out there but you've got to select the correct one for your farm that pre-mown of that sward is not the correct option for calvin and um, he would have been better taking that off there as bales you're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. There's a lot of interest in sheep shearing at the moment, with Ivan Scott, the champion from Donegal, setting a new record this week. Do you want to give it a try? Shearer George Graham from County Wexford shares his tips with Peter Varley. Well, the preparation of sheep for shearing is, is very, very important. That's why sheep should be cutched and cleaned up pre-shearing. That's very important, from along with shearing from an animal welfare point of view, uh, to prevent fly strife and uh, to lambs will certainly thrive better and yours for, for shearing. Uh, also, pre-shearing, uh, it's much easier on the shearer and on the animal if sheep are off of all solids and liquids for at least 10 to 12 hours before shearing. Now, that doesn't work everywhere, but where it does work, it's very, very important if it can be done. It's equally important putting them in pre-shearing that they don't go in on a clean concrete floor. Uh, they better go in on slats is ideal, uh, but if you haven't slats, which we haven't everywhere, on an old uh, bed that sheep have been in for the winter time, if there's a lot of loose straw, it's going to contaminate the wool and destroy the wool, and that's very important that that doesn't happen. So that's very important, and the lambs drafted off. The lambs should be always drafted off pre-shearing. So them are a couple of important points on that. There's a hub for shearing. The trailer, we use mobile trailing unit, a lot of people do, some people shear on boards, but that's the hub where sheep, sheep will run properly and fill easily into it. Uh, also that the shorn sheep and the shorn can go away properly because a single sheep on their own can cause a very very bad accident running into a helper or into a shearer and pulling a hand piece out of the hand and a bad, cause a bad accident that's very very important as well uh, the sheep must be going to the cellar easy so there's no stress on the animal or on the helpers around the setting up for the shearing then setting up on the trailer you should never set up with your back shearing to a draft you also need good light and uh, you're sheared on a level surface and ideally sheared on boards or a rubber mat i prefer boards on big sheep it's certainly easier to move them around on that's very important a sheep will not be comfortable and it's very bad in your own body and back sheared on concrete and also the equipment bank falls it certainly will be broken uh, the next thing we use we mostly use electric machines so we're dealing with electricity electric cables it's very important that they're up properly we know the source where power comes out and at all times we should use a circuit breaker that's very important. If the cables are open out in the yard, that there's no loaders or any vehicle going to come and catch in the cables, or if they're down on the ground flat, that the animals don't catch in them or somebody doesn't come in and drive over them. That's equally important. That the machines are up the proper height with the end of the dropper just touching the boards and they're up safe, not just swinging over rope, that the rope will actually wear across the gear or something like that, and the next thing the machine falls down on your back. Then that's the important thing about setting up for shearing, that the cables are set up properly and all that's safe. Uh, at all times we must think safely and at all times where they were doing shearing demonstrations, shearing commercially on the farms or in competition, we must look after the welfare of the animal at all times. Um, three big reasons why we should never shear wet sheep. The first one being we're dealing with electricity, and electricity and water is a very bad combination. The second reason, one wet sheep, and you feel the dampness and cold going right into your skin, into your bones. If you continue to do that, your shearing career will be very short. And the third reason is uh, wet wool, wool will just go mouldy and be destroyed and be of no value to anybody. So they're the three main reasons why we should never shear wet sheep. What else are we to go by? Um, it's also very important for uh, maybe farmers or beginner shearers or learner shearers. We do shearing courses. I'm the senior instructor with the Irish Sheep Shears Association, and if we make a contact with them, we can arrange courses anywhere at any time. Um, but for anyone starting off shearing, the equipment we use, you have to be very careful. You have to know the right comb uh, to use on different wool types and different sheep. If you're shearing long sheep with big long wool and very warm weather, uh, the much softer in the skin you need a rounder uh, bevel comb and the more of a pointy bevel on uh, stickier sheep uh, earlier in the season. So that's very, very important. It's also very important that you look after your gear properly. 
and it's properly sharpened. If you're not shearing with properly sharpened combs and cutters, uh, that's not going to be good for the sheep. It's just going to be pulling the wool instead of cutting, and the sheep are not going to be comfortable. So that's really, really important. Uh, the control of the sheep, taking them out of the trailer, uh, taking them out in a controlled, proper manner. If you are shearing big, big sheep, maybe 100, 120 kilos, if you don't use your head on them, if you're going to continue to use your body all the time, that's just going to wear you out. The sheep will win. You will never win that battle. So that's very, very important as well. The presentation of wool, that starts with the crutch in the sheep before shearing, that are crutched, that are properly presented. Then we don't have shed stain when we get in lambs and yos to draft them off, because if they're very daggy sheep, they'll just rub against the lambs and other sheep. That contaminates the wool. You'll have shed stain then, and that devalues the wool. And I know this year the wool price is not very good, but if we don't present it properly, uh, we're probably going to get lesser of wool, and wool has to be worth a lot more money. It's probably one of the greatest natural products we ever produce. It's the only product that I know that will keep you cool in summer and warm in winter. It's also very important when you're finished shearing at the end of the day that you change your clothes, even in the warmest day in the year, that you put something warm on you, but get out with the greasy, dirty shearing clothes and put dry clothes on you. If you want to continue shearing, that's very, very bad to stay in shearing clothes. That's very, very important. Equally, at break times or meal times, it's very important to wash your hands thoroughly and never wash them out of a drinking sock or water around sheds that's just lying there. It may be contaminated, and if you have cuts or anything on your hands, you very easily could pick up wheels disease if there's rats around. So always use running clean water if you're going to wash your hands. Uh, very often when we're shearing on farms, uh, farmers have a habit of hanging a wool pack out of a loader or maybe out of a dung fork on a loader, quite close to the shearing, which can be very, very dangerous. And it's often usually head high, and uh, if that's going to be used, there should be a, a barrier put across the top of the teeth so it cannot cause an accident. It can be very, very dangerous. And if I see that around, I will just stop shearing till that's uh, uh, made safe because it's, it's a big risk factor. And we, at all times, we must think safely. And we have a detailed video with George detailing the whole process at FarmersJournal.tv. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. Now let's travel to New Zealand where the Irish Farmers Journal's news editor Patrick Donoghue followed the Field Days event last weekend. 130,000 people visited the largest farming event in the country and of course some of them were Irish. Among the exhibitors Patrick met Paul Kelly, the vice president of Mucol. Paul, your first time uh, in New Zealand launching the, the product, which is well established in Ireland at this stage, but what's the feeling being uh, amongst the, the Kiwi farmers that you've met so far this week? Very interested in it. Uh, they're big into technology in New Zealand. The bigger dairy farmers with the, the milk price the way it is, that it's, it's very difficult for them to adopt to big volumes of call, but they would be very interested in having one or two uh, moo calls for the heifers, uh, first time calvers, um, for both beginning and end of the um, calving period. And the, uh, the, the the bigger companies, any any traction with, with those, the, the, the milk machine companies or the, or the co-ops? Or yes, like we're talking to a number of companies. We've maybe the big five uh, distributors in New Zealand, in milking companies, um, farm stores, um, animal health distributors, they're all very interested and we, we're in a position now where we're going to select maybe two distributors, main distributors for the New Zealand market and we're looking to now select a distributor for the Australian market which will be a different exercise. Early days but exceeded expectations so far in the field days? Very much so. The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Meanwhile, our market specialist Felim O'Neill was in France to take a look at this important destination for beef exports. And the outlook he got from Philippe Choteau, the head economist of the French Livestock Institute, was not positive. We have two main problems, in fact. One is with export. Traditionally, our big outlets for young bull beef mainly are Italy, Greece. Everybody is conscious uh, know the deep crisis uh, where these economies are. Mm -hmm. So the difficulty now is uh, to find alternative markets. The second one is uh, to, to find value for the bulk of the cows from the beef herd, let's say the Charolaise, which is uh, the core of the market. And this core of the market is now attacked from one side by the premium market mm -hmm. and from the other side by the, the basic the basic the market. value the value side yeah. of the market and the core market 
uh-huh. is decreasing at the same time the premium market is increasing and also the, the promotionals and all the low price market. Most of your beef in France is sold through the retail sector, through the supermarket sector, is yeah, that right correct? So. Mm-hmm. And uh, how much of a role or how important is the traditional butcher in French retail sales or have, has their importance uh, diminished as time has passed? Uh, they still represent 15% of the beef which is sold on the French market, which mm-hmm. is not bad. And the, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the butcher countries are now increasing inside the supermarkets. So is that how the, you talk there about the premium end of sales growing yeah, in the right. supermarket? That is over the butcher counter, that is the bit that is a growth area, as is the value range at the bottom? Yeah, right. So, and, and also to give back more trust to mm-hmm. the consumer. They do not rely as much on the, the barquette, mm-hmm. you know, the cuts prepaid as they, as they were in the past. Uh, you mentioned that as well as being an importing country, France exports considerable quantities of beef. You explained the problem you had with two big markets, uh, Greece and Italy, and I think they're well known across Europe as having countries that experience severe recession. Where is the potential for the French beef industry to grow in the next five years? For me, the bigger potential is for livestock market around Mediterranean Sea to Turkey, to Lebanon, or even to North Africa or even to the Near East. But everyone dreams about China or Far East mm-hmm. countries, not for life cattle, but mainly mm-hmm. for, for beef. For beef, yeah. But it's very difficult to, to approach these markets mm-hmm. because of the sanitary status, but also because we are not so used in France to do a lot of marketing to far export. Okay. It's, a very, it's very different from the Irish industry, mm-hmm. which is completely focused on export. Yeah. The French exporters, since the last crisis of BAC, have been restricted to the neighbouring countries mainly. Okay. Um, finally, for Ireland, uh, France is our second most important export market after the UK. Does the French industry see that as a major problem for it, that you are under pressure because of imported product coming into France? Does that have a depressing effect on your overall market? Or is your market big enough and the overall quantity of imports so small as not to have any significant impact? I do not think that the Irish beef import have a, a very huge impact on the French market. The main in, impact, it's much more on beef, low quality beef, mm-hmm. which, go, which is sold through the catering sector mm-hmm. and uh, without any label. This is the, the, the main threat Mm-hmm. To the for the French market for the French beef farmers. In terms of uh, okay, French beef industry is going through uh, the doldrums as we say it. It's going through a depressed period at the present. Do you think that that will recover? That in five to ten year vision for the industry, you would have a positive outlook for the French beef industry in particular. We're obliged to 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 imagine a positive <laughs> positive future. Yes. but we have to change quite a lot of things in the French beef industry now. And the main thing, I think, is to be much more consumer focused. And uh, that would change perhaps the level of price between Mm -hmm. the different kinds of beef. And also we have to make efforts, for example, to maturate more longer the beef we sold Mm -hmm. in order to get no deception among the consumers. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Back home, if you're planning to start an agricultural course in the coming years, there may be change ahead. After a public consultation last month, Chagask is now preparing a new plan for its education department. The man in charge of this area is Tony Pettit, and he answered Anthony Jordan's questions. Yeah, well, there's two things going on there, actually. The, the Green Start programme has been there for about uh, 30 years now. It has changed a lot in content to reflect the difference in farming. Things like discussion groups have been included in it. All areas and up, uh, new requirements in breeding, uh, say ABI, Herd Plus. So it's, it's continually been revamped, but at the same time, it's 30 years ago since it was fundamentally reviewed. So we are looking at it now. The awards, the existing awards themselves, have been recently reviewed by QQI through Chagas, but Chagas are also looking at a longer-term vision for education in terms of what the needs of the industry will be if we're to look over 
over maybe 10 years and a longer period. I suppose it's driven very much by Foodwise 2025 and what's coming out of that. So we are looking, uh, I suppose, basically apart from the competencies and the needs and the skills and knowledge of future farmers will require. And we've embarked on very extensive uh, stakeholder consultation actually to do that. So the Chagas Strategic Education Vision Project will be running over the next few months and hopefully in early 2017 we will prepare a report which will give some shape and direction to how Chagas might address education needs in the future. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. There's no doubt distance learning and internet-based courses will grow in importance in the future, but that would mean connecting rural Ireland to broadband first. Rural Affairs Minister Heather Humphreys brought up the issue at the Lakeland Milk Quality Awards and I asked her for more details. Broadband is becoming like a utility, uh, the same as uh, electricity is. And what we have is a situation, despite you know investments over the years on different broadband plans, what we have here at the minute now is the National Broadband Plan. And this is the National Plan to roll out broadband to those areas where the private operators uh, will not go because it is not economically viable for them to do so. And uh, what we will do is we will um, subsidise the private operators to go in and provide broadband. But what you're looking at here is uh, 30% of those who don't have broadband or any, you know, a, a reasonable quality of broadband actually sits in 96% of the landmass. So you can appreciate the huge task that this is. And it is akin to rural electrification, like I said earlier. It falls with myself and uh, Minister uh, Dennis Nocton. Um, so both of us are working very closely together. He actually has responsibility for the National Broadband Plan. My uh, area is in terms of the, the rural uh, rollout. So when the, the plan or when the contracts are signed, I will then have responsibility for rollout in rural Ireland. But in the meantime, there's a lot of work I can do and I want to work with local authorities, work closely with them in setting up a broadband task force so that when the broadband plan is ready to be rolled out and the contracts have been signed, that there are no roadblocks in the counties uh, that are uh, ready to get the broadband, such areas such as planning permission, ducting, and there's a lot of different things that, that we need to make sure are in place and they're ready for broadband. Finally, um, you left a job uh, in the works uh, before the election, uh, reform of hedge cutting and burning dates for vegetation. Uh, Where are we on this and what are the next steps and when are they going to take place? Well, I've got agreement from Cabinet that uh, that bill will come back in uh, where it left off. So it'll be going to committee stage in the Shannon and, and uh, it's something that I want to progress as quickly as possible during the next term of, uh, of the Dáil. Uh, it's on, I, I hope I may get it started before this, before this uh, session is over, but it's likely it'll be uh, in, in, the, in the autumn sitting. So that would be for next summer, nothing this year, end of August, too early. I don't think we'll, we'll probably have enough time to get it through this before before uh, the end of August uh, this year. No, realistically, uh, I don't want to, you know, uh, have you know raise expectations. But real, realistically, I don't think that I can get it through. But what I w- would say is that uh, you know the council do have authority. If if there's a health and safety issue in terms of there needs to be a hedge cut, it rests there with the local authority and talk to them about it. And uh, they can cut the hedge in in the interest of road safety. The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Finally, the FBD Farmyard Awards are back. Do you think your farm deserves a prize for tidiness and safety? I'm now joined by Murray Lavery, the editor of Irish Country Living, to give you all the details and how to enter the competition. We've now been running them, I think, nine years in association with FBD. So they've been excellent sponsors and we've been able to locate all around the country in every county, wonderful, wonderful farmyards. And, you know, every year at the ploughing we present the prizes and every year at the ploughing there are tears and tears because it's not just the people on the farm, it's their parents, it's their siblings. They've all taken kind of a responsibility for creating a beautiful farmyard. That's true, I remember that from the ploughing last year a very emotional winner indeed. very yeah, emotional yeah. yes and it, because it's it's kind of it's it's maybe generations of work and um, you know entering the farmyard competition is, is something that people are very proud to do there's a huge sense of pride in the, in the, pride in the work that they're, they're at and I think you know having a good 
safe place in which to work is really, really important, particularly when you look at the number of accidents and serious accidents and fatal ones indeed that take place on farms. So you've said the word entering. So how does this work? Who can enter? Uh, and how? Well, the competition is open to every farmer across the whole of the island of Ireland. Um, it's broken down into several categories. We have the livestock, which is the beef and sheep category. There's a €2,000 first prize there and a runner-up prize as well. Then there's the dairy livestock winner and a runner-up category. And then there's alternative farm enterprises, which basically includes most things that won't go under um, dairying or livestock and sheep. So you're talking about tillage, talking about pigs, poultry, horticulture, all of those sort of uh, sort of farm operations. And this year we have two new um, uh, uh, categories. We have the ent- Equestrian Enterprise of the Year and we also have the Farm Safety Champion of the Year. We're really, really taking farm safety very seriously. So it's not about uh, only about having a beautiful place to work in, it's also yeah, and keeping it, the it one really thing, safe. And I want to make sure that people understand this, it is not about flower boxes or flower baskets. It isn't about that at all. It is really about, you know, knowing where there's any danger and dealing with it and having everything in a place and everything in the right place. Um, you know, different, you, the, the marking scheme is all up on Farmers Journal, uh, www.farmersjournal.ie forward slash farmyard. Um, and, and what we're really looking for now are four photos that would be, uh, you know, would represent the, ca- the, the kind of categories that the judges are going to be looking at, such as maybe shelter, bait, belting, layout, safety features, that kind of thing. And a covering letter of 200 words outlining why you should win the competition. Now that needs to be sent into farmyard at farmersjournal.ie and it needs to be in by the 5th of August. So there's actually plenty of time here. We have the rest of the month of June and all August. And you know, the schools are breaking up now and there's a bunch of teenagers who are going to tell you they're bored. And you know what? There's no need for them to be bored because they can get out with the paint or get out with the whitewash or get out with the sweeping brush and they can make the place an amazing amount of work in in a very short time. Actually, our very first winners were from County Kerry and it was their teenagers who decided to do it as a summer project and get the money at the end of it. Um, uh, And they ended up being, being the winners that particular year. Okay, so yeah. many hands make light work and, and everybody can really make it work. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to no, be a brand new about, building. No, it's not about that at all. And it's not about big farms. It's about, you know, small farms. It's about, you know, people with 10 or 12 cows. You know, it's right across the board. And the other thing is you have a neighbour and you know and you admire their farmyard. Every time you pass by, you say, God, don't they keep the place terrible well? Well, you can nominate your neighbour as well. And also um, nomination can come through FPD, the different offices around the country, and also through the Chagask offices around the country. OK, thanks very much, Mairead. The Irish Farmers Journal podcast, online at farmersjournal.ie, on the Irish Farmers Journal app, and on iTunes, every Thursday. Brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy.